Tracing Your Family Roots. I'm Janelle Blue, president of the Mount Vernon Genealogical Society and the sponsor of this program. And today we're going to talk with Chuck Mason, my co-host, um, about understanding records and what they're telling you. And if you've done a lot of research or even a little bit, you know that sometimes there are terms um, that are different from, from what you normally think of, and you can't take those for granted. So Chuck, tell us about this. Well, I like to start this when I present this program with a picture of a church pew, which they're going to put up here okay. on the screen for us. There. there. And yeah. for most of us, when we think of a church pew, we think of something similar to, right. to what's in the picture. Some of them may have a cushion or, you know, be a slightly different style, but that's what we would think of for the most part today. But our colonial ancestors thought of something much different. And this is a typical church pew in the Anglican or the Church of England church. Mm -hmm. It's actually mm -hmm. a box with doors, and this happens to be uh, down at Christ Church down in Old Town, Alexandria. And then we have a second picture that we'll flip to, and that's, that's uh, the boxes there a little closer to the front of the church. But that was what our ancestors thought about when you said the word church pew. The so, have you ever have you ever gone into one of those? I mean, I oh, yeah, I don't know how they they stood it because it was it's so. Oh, great. they are, they are so uncomfortable. <laughs> in fact, I went to a funeral at Christ Church in Alexandria, and of course, the boxes are still there, and yes. you sit in it. And an hour of the church service was about an hour and a half, and by the oh. time I got done. I couldn't wait to stand up because it really was hard on, on your back. So yes, and I've, I've sat in George Washington's pew there, and I've also been Christ Church in Philadelphia and sat in Benjamin, Benjamin Franklin, and I think it was Betsy Ross's pews uh -huh. there. So. Do you suppose they donated money and oh, that's why oh, they you, have their you name? You paid yeah. an annual yeah. fee back for then that. for, so for your space. box. You're renting, renting <laughs> that box or, or pew. So, so really over time, things have changed as far as the meanings of words. And so we really have to understand what do they mean. Early on in my research, my grandfather had always said that his father was orphaned. And, you know, being inexperienced, I added to that thought. So I thought orphaned, who knows who his parents were, but I also added into that he probably wasn't originally, his name probably wasn't originally Mason. Uh huh. You know, so yeah, I, I mean, thought he probably thinking. was adopted, so who knows? So I left the Mason line alone other than the generations that, that I really knew. Well, what I found out when I went to a legal dictionary is the term orphan, I usually think of it as a child. But right. anybody who loses a parent becomes an orphan. Under oh, the legal term. Gosh. So at 54, when my father died, I became an orphan. <laughs> at 50, uh, almost 58, when my mother died, another I was time, yeah. an orphan another time. So what I found with my, my great-grandfather, what I really didn't know a whole lot about the family, but I did find him, he was born in 1864, and I found him and his 12-year-old sister living with their parents up in, in, uh, in Belleville Township, which is in Essex County, New Jersey. And then I couldn't find him after that. Mm. I finally eventually found him. I knew that he had ended up down in Vineland, New Jersey. And I, I found him down in Vineland living with an aunt and uncle. It turned out it was his mother's sister and her husband uh, down in Vineland, uh, and he was 16 years old. But 
I did a whole thing of trying to find the family and I could not find any records of the family or of his parents after 1870 census. Which is a clue. So I kind of killed him off. Sometime between 1870 and 1875 when they did not appear in the state census. Mm -hmm. And so I had mm. that five year period that mm. I killed him off. Well, what I later found out, I found him eventually down in, and this was back before we had ancestry and all kinds of indexes, I found him living down in Vineman with his aunt and uncle. He was 16 in 1880. But what I eventually found was his mother, his father died in 1881 and his mother died in 1882. Uh -huh. So he was 17 and 18 before he lost his parents. So, you know, yes, he became an orphan yeah. then, but he wasn't a young child like I had imagined. When, so. when you found him living with his aunt and uncle, did they have the same last name? And, and, no. and was, he, is, was he enumerated with the Mason name or with no, the... He was aunt, enumerated. Aunt his mother married a man by the name of William Henry Ash. And was he given that name? So, no, he, he was Samuel C. Mason. Okay, so. And he was listed as a nephew. Okay. And of course, his, his mother was Sarah Ann Bennett and his aunt was Mary Ann Bennett. Okay, and so, okay. So, you know, I knew that the Ash family was related to my family, but nobody could tell me how they ah, were related. And, ah. and I finally, in doing the research of trying to find his parents and when they died, I finally got into the Ash family, uh -huh. or the Bennett family, rather, and found that Sarah had this younger sister, okay. Mary Ann, okay. who married him to the Ash family. And okay. so, so that's how that whole scenario you know, finally worked out. So, so we really, I always say, if you are going to deal with records, particularly legal records, go get, I always say Black's Law Dictionary, but now you don't even have to go get Black's Law Dictionary. Yeah, you can, you know, you can do it on the internet, and usually you have more than two or three. You know, there's probably at least a half dozen legal dictionaries yeah. out there. Yeah. And I always say, look at the terms in all of them. Black's was certainly the most used legal dictionary, but the others, sometimes there's a slight variation in the meeting, and sometimes it's exactly what you know, yeah. Black says. So you really should understand the meaning of things. And, and some of the things that trip us up with the use of words in colonial times is like in-laws. You know, this is the, the family of the spouse. Yeah. But, you know, in earlier times, it may refer to step-parents also. Oh. That's cousin was another term. Cousin was also used for nephew or niece, or sometimes any blood relationship, or relationship by marriage. Aha. Uh -huh. So that one... So it was pretty loosely used yes, then. Yes. Nephew was, was used for niece and also grandchildren. And brother is another one. You know, it, there are a number of relationships that people may refer to. It may be yeah. be your parents' siblings. It it may be be a, a, you know an in law. A woman marries a man, but they may refer to him as brother. It could be a half brother. It could be a step brother. It also could refer to someone in a church. Right. Because there were certain right. churches. And, That's right. And senior and junior is another one that trips people up because we think today senior, whoever the, the father is, if the son is named with the exact same name, then he is a junior. But in earlier times, it may be a grandfather and a grandson or an uncle and a nephew because... 
uh, you know, they just referred to them. They had the same name, but they weren't father and son and the term used like we use it today. And, I, and I've, ha I've got that example in my family where it was sort of who was the eldest living person, person. took on the senior. Se yes. But there could have been a senior before him. Yes, and um, that, that did happen in, in earlier times. And of course, the, the thing that I have in one of my lines is we have the grandfather, we have, uh, you know, or the father, the son, he becomes a grandfather, but it, it's not the son that uses the name, it's one of his brothers that gives his son the name. And then one of the other grandsons in another line gives his child the name. So I have this uh, senior, junior, third, and fourth, but they are not a direct line coming down in the family. So, so it's something you really have to pay attention to those kinds of things. I learned that the hard way because I was looking at a very old will, mm -hmm. you know, like early 1800s. And I noticed that he named all of his children in, in what he had bequeathed to them. And then he said, and then he left these other things to uh, some other named people. Mm -hmm. And one of them was you know, John Williams Jr. And I yeah. thought, wait a minute, why are you, why didn't you add him, you know, where the children were more. instead of, and yeah. then I realized that many times that yeah. nephew is the junior, yeah. but it's. Well, in, in the case of this family, it was Ambrose Sr., Ambrose Jr., and the grandson and the great-grandson also used Ambrose Jr. So I oh had to really pay attention to the records now. Unfortunately, the grandson died young. Uh -huh. So it was not as much of a problem as it could have been. There wasn't <laughs> as much of an overlap. And on, uh, with women, we don't generally, even if women have uh, the same name as a grandmother or a mother, we don't see them using senior or junior, no. but sometimes in some families they will say big Nancy and little oh, Nancy sure. and differentiate yeah. that way. So Yeah, I have a little grandma. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and she was my great grandmother. Yeah. Uh, another thing that we find in wills is a term called my now wife. Mm -hmm. And people think, okay, he had a previous wife. Not, Not necessarily. necessarily yeah. He may have but he is referring to the woman he is married to. It may be the only wife that he ever had. Right. It just you know, depends on. Uh, and another term is natural son. That is definitely indicating a blood relationship. It is, is their blood son. Uh, illegitimate children were referred to as base, B-A-S-E. Or I have seen in records where they're quite honest about it, and they just call him a bastard child. You may find that right in the, the terms, so. Uh, you know, I just, <laughs> I, I, I just went through some, some uh, church records that had just been translated from the, the original German, and there they said, you know, in this church document, mm -hmm. you know, Robert Smith presents his illegitimate Admit, granddaughter, yeah. the, the, and it was yeah. just so, why did you have to, have to say, say that? that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so, you know, we really need to, to take and know the definitions of terms, and when, when you get into legal documents, a lot of legal documents have kind of the, the jargon that has to be there. You know, the, the state says you have to have but I always say, go and look at the meaning of each of those words. Basically, in like a deed, the words mean the same thing. But depending on what state and the time frame right. and all, you can have eight or ten words in a row at right. the beginning of a document that all basically are saying the same thing. But knowing those and knowing what is the norm at the time, and you can find that out by reading the documents, the deeds before or after, or the same way with wills, the way a will may begin, reading the way the will begins for your ancestor and the ones before, and looking at is there a term that's missing there? 
is there a reason why it is? And it, it goes mm. into really looking at what that meaning is to, to totally understand it. Uh, but you know, knowing what the norm is can alert you to something that is not the norm that you need to re really pursue to understand what's going on in the records. And looking at a deed, you always see the dower rights, the, mm -hmm. the dower, you know, where the wife is now taken Re aside in a separate, separate room, room. And, and are you okay with this, this transaction? And my guess is that there are, you know, that's also by state to some extent. Yeah. Um, I know in Texas, you know, women were given separate property rights well before the rest of the United, United States. States. Um, and so it's good to know yeah. uh, and understand yeah. the, that. The only state that I'm aware of that really did not have the, the dower, uh, you know, the law of requiring was North Carolina. Oh, really? Yeah, they, they didn't, according to Helen Leary, it, it was not the common thing. So in that case, when I listened to this lecture that Helen had given, seeing that a woman is releasing her dower in the North Carolina deed is a little red flag that they may have come from another state. Ah. And ah. they may have said, particularly if they're buying the land, I don't care what your law says, I want that release of dower so I know yeah. I'm covered. Right. So that can be you know, helpful in finding, particularly as she said, Virginia ancestors who disappear well, they've gone down to North Carolina, and so, huh. so you know, the, those kinds of things to understand what's really going on. It's so important. And then, another thing is medical terms. You know, uh, like Black's Law Dictionary, there there are a number of medical dictionaries that give the old meaning of things. I'm very fortunate. I have have a good friend whose daughter. Uh, was the medical examiner up in, in Rochester, New York. I forget the county. Uh -huh. And so whenever I'm looking at a death certificate and I don't really know what is going on, I'll give it to Janice and she'll send it up to her daughter and she'll look at it and she'll, well, this is what it means today. And you know, So you had a lot of things that really didn't necessarily make sense but you know, knowing the, what the term means out of a medical dictionary really helps you to understand, okay, they, they actually died of this. Yeah. And, you know, this well, is what, and of course, it, it, if dying. you're looking at in the 1860s, that medical, you know, whoever signed that or gave the information to the church, they may not have known. I mean, I, ha I just saw oh, yeah. the death of one child who died of cramps. Mm -hmm. Well, what does that mean? Mean, yeah, um, yeah. That's the kind of thing that you know medical dictionaries uh, would would certainly help with. Yeah, and of course, it it really depends. Uh, I think it was the NGS Providence Conference that I listened to a lecture by uh, an emergency room doctor, and he went through the scenario of this man that came into the emergency room that had been treated for a heart condition by his doctor, but ended up in the emergency room. And he went through, the man did end up dying. If he had died in the emergency room, what it would have said on the death certificate. If he had died before he got to the emergency room, what it would have oh, said. It was a really interesting lecture. In fact, I was thinking the other day, I had to pull that tape out and yeah. listen to it again because yeah. it's, it's been a while. And another thing that, that throws people off is local expressions or slang terms. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I had a friend, unfortunately, she's passed away, but I took a course years ago for Boy Scout leader training, and she was from New England, and she had some, some terms. A couple of three was, was one of the ones, a and it's like, three? okay, Brenda, is it two or is it three? <laughs> <laughs> And here in Virginia, my spouse, they talk about carrying things like carrying the car in to get it fixed or carrying my mother to take her oh, here really? or there. Yeah. And so, you know, I've 
you're going to pick up the car and take it in. <laughs> the... So those kinds of things, or slang terms, you know, the slang of, of the, the generation can throw people off if you don't know what that means. Well, you can just look at today, just compare yeah. the words today, today. Uh, yeah. and it's amazing yeah. how yeah. some of those meanings and, have changed. And some of the sentence structure today, there's, there's someone well known on TV that has a term that I think my English teachers would probably <laughs> cringe if they heard that. Uh, and another thing that we, we get into some of our, our documents and things is foreign words. You know, foreign words, some become a part of, of our, our language and, and things that are created. Not necessarily legal documents, but it may be terms that you may see in newspapers or people may write in letters or things like that. So, Understanding what those words mean is really important mm -hmm. so that you know exactly what they're, they're talking about. And of course, then some of the other problems we have is handwriting. Oh my gosh, oh my gosh. And, and of course, my, my thing with dealing with any kind of a handwritten document is do a transcription the first time you go through figuring those words out. Put it down so that you know what the word yeah, is. Yeah, so you don't because have to I can keep struggling. Guarantee at some point, some document, you're going to have to go back and you're going to have to determine what did that word say. And so, you know, comparing the document the words in the document, letters, things like that. It can be time consuming. I've got one, one deed that I probably have about 20 hours in translating what it says because the handwriting is so bad. It is just so bad. But that think about it, you and I are used to cursive um, and, and mm -hmm. so it's bad for us. But I recently had an experience with a very young person, a, like a 20-year-old graduate, a college graduate, who said, I can't help you with this deed because I can't read the cursive. Yes, uh, we, we got a postcard from my spouse's cousin's son the other day. And of course, I send greeting cards and write in them. And it was all in print. Yeah. And it dawned on me, yeah, he probably can't read what I'm sending. Mom, <laughs> Mom probably has to read the cards to him. So, but yes, in fact, when, they, when I found out they were, were starting to not put or teach cursive in schools, I thought, okay, 50 years, I want to come back and be the interpreter for genealogists who can't read the cursive writing in the documents. You know, the, one thing I want to add to that is, um, so I've got a lot of German records that are in the 1860s, and I went through, you know, the record, and I could, I could find the names and the dates, mm -hmm. and so, I, okay, I'm good with that. Mm -hmm. Well, I have recently paid to have them actually translated, translated, and I found there's a bunch of other stuff, stuff in there in that there. I never knew, and yes. had I not had them translated, I might not have, not seen, have seen that. It. Yeah. So it's well worth making sure oh, that yeah. you get it translated oh, yeah. by somebody who can read, read that very the, old yeah, language. Writing. And other things that, that create problems is spelling. Yeah. You know, years ago, as long as the person writing it could interpret what the word was, they didn't have uniform that, spelling yes. of, of words. It uh, was very phonetic you know, I, sometimes. I have found, you know, the same word spelled four, five, six different ways in a document. And punctuation yeah. uh, was not always standard, so you can have sentences that just run on no and on and even. on. No, yeah. no periods, no commas, no you know, question, nothing. And so what I always do is I put those in in a box so I know it wasn't there, but here's uh -huh. where that thought stops. Yeah. Uh, and abbreviations is another thing that, that can trip us up because people could abbreviate things however they want it. You know, they might do the first couple of letters and the last letter 
Uh, they might select a letter at the beginning, one or two out of the middle, and the end as an abbreviation. I've, I have seen the same word again abbreviated more than one time in a document that I'm trying to determine yeah. or decipher what it's saying. I've seen, for instance, John um, it is J-N-O. Mm -hmm. So if you're doing an a, a ancestry search, mm -hmm. you may want to search under that instead mm -hmm. of just John or Johan, yeah. because often yeah. that's the way yeah. they've got it. And another thing it's important to know about is geographic changes. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the changes of the names of counties when counties oh, are yeah. divided or, you know, towns and things like that. And street name changes and house number changes. I was trying to determine what house this family lived in in Woodbury, New Jersey in Gloucester County. And I had a house number in a number of documents and I had a street name. Well, it was fairly easy to find the street name in the early 1900s. They changed the name of the street to Barber Avenue. Okay. No so, problem. So. But then I'm looking at the house numbers and I didn't have a house number ah. that matched. And I didn't have a space where a house could have been torn down mm. in between any of them. Well, then I happened to find a, a thing from the newspaper where they uniformly changed the north side of the street to odd numbers in the south oh to gosh. even, and they did the same thing with the east and west. And when I found that, I was able to go find the house and know exactly where they lived. Chuck, we could just talk about this, <laughs> this forever, forever, but we're just about to run out of time. And I wanna thank you so much. I'm sure our viewers are thinking about all of the yes. terms that they wanna go look up now because um, this is very interesting and it's helpful for genealogists to remember this. Yes. Um, I, I just wanna invite everybody to the Mount Vernon Genealogical Society. We have a website, mvgenealogy.org. It's showing on the screen now. Uh, we are still doing our programs by Zoom, but we hope, we hope that in the next uh, few months, we're going to be back in our quarters at um, the Holland Hall Center on 1500 Shenandoah Road. Uh, but meanwhile, look us up on the website because we're still doing lots of things and we would love for you to join us. So thank you and thanks again, Chuck. You're welcome. Yeah, this, this one, it wasn't my family, but it's a family that I have used for a number of articles I've written.